All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is welcome to our fourth installment of this webinar series, um, Splitting the Property Tax Rule, the Technical Provisions of Prop 15. Today's episode is titled, What Happens Next Week? <laughs> and we are seven days out from the November election. Already millions of voters have mailed in their ballots and we will know soon uh, whether California's property tax protections um, will be preserved by the voters or whether or not the voters will decide one of the greatest changes to California's tax structure uh, in, in generation. Prop 15 is a massive property tax increase on business property and um, it would require market value assessments for commercial and industrial property. Uh, this is a change in California's uniform taxation of locally assessed properties the measure eliminates acquisition value assessments for business taxpayers, increasing uncertainty going forward, and establishing an appeal system that puts all taxpayers at a disadvantage when contesting values. I'm chairing the No on Proposition 15 campaign with Alan Zarenberg, Rob Lapsley, and Rex Heim. The four of us have been working closely with Tom Ross, Tom Hiltak, and Tony Russo, and an army of the best and brightest minds uh, in the political circles to defeat this. So let me introduce our guest, Tom Ross. For the past uh, 25 years, Tom has worked to elect candidates, pass ballot measures, develop strategies for Fortune 100 companies. Tom founded Meridian Pacific in 2003 and has led a number of California's major political fights from passing redistricting form, uh, open primaries, and stopping shakedown lawsuits, and working with Caltex to help pass Prop 26 in 2010. Uh, which requires a two-thirds vote for fee increases. Additionally, Tom has uh, served as lead strategist for campaigns to defeat statewide tax measures. We're also joined by Tom Hiltak. Tom is the managing partner at Bell McAndrews and Hiltak. He's practiced political and election law exclusively since 1988 and served as legal counsel and treasurer to statewide and local ballot measure committees political action committees and candidates. Uh, Tom is also Caltax's attorney on election laws and reporting issues. And uh, if you need a good recommendation for a lawyer, he's your guy. Uh, Tom specializes in drafting ballot measures and counsels on qualification efforts for ballot measure campaigns. And um, he litigates on ballot and ballot uh, pamphlet language issues. Uh, Tom Ross and Tom Hiltak have been working around the clock to stop Prop 15, and I just want to give them a huge thank you uh, for all the work that they've been doing on this campaign. Uh, we're facing some monumental challenges, um, but with uh, Ross and Hiltak on board, we've got a fighting chance to win. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll give uh, Tom Ross the floor to start. Great. Thanks, Rob. And, and um, I, I just want to start by thanking you um, for all of your leadership. Um, on this fight against Prop 15, um, it feels like um, feels like a decade ago, and maybe it has been a decade, but um, uh, or more. But but in this particular battle, I feel like um, you know it was it was well, it was about a year ago. We were actually able to go meet in person. Uh, we were up there in Tahoe and able to you know kind of have a conversation about where this was going to head. Um, I don't know if we were right on point, but I think we hit the big the big picture strokes pretty on point. Um, and your leadership um, uh, really on this measure and CalPACs for decades, like you said, with Prop 26 um, uh, is really crucial to the business community. Um, I think if it were not for you and, and driving that business community leadership, this measure, um, we, we would have we, we would be dead in the water, frankly. Uh, and all that you guys have done uh, on the fundraising front, on the uh, policy front, uh, on the coalition front has just been crucial. Um, and, 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 and it's not just you, it's how you've brought team and, and, and people together, other associations together. Um, you know, this, this coalition has some of the most diverse groups and it's because of the way you approach this and the way you've taken this on. Um, and make, made it inclusive, you know, it's allowed us to have, I think we have every major trade association in the state, you know, we've got every local chamber of commerce in the state and those, you know, I get it, we're going to get those and we're going to get local taxpayer organizations, but it's when you start adding, you know, Willie Brown, it's when you start adding the NAACP, it's when you start adding social justice groups, that's when you start to kind of try and have, when, when, when we start to build some critical mass to have an impact on the election. 
Um, so it really couldn't happen without your leadership. And I want to thank you and thank Caltax and the whole team over there and all of your members for really, um, really pushing on this. Hey, Tom, um, Tom, I also, on the same vein, something really critically important in this whole campaign has been through Caltax's leadership and its members' expertise on, on the subject matter at issue here, you know, we've been able to dissect this initiative, which is very complicated and very complex. And those are the issues that we're running this campaign on, right? We're running this campaign on, on errors or, or issues that, that were drafted as part of this initiative that were fleshed out by the expertise of the folks at Caltax and, and the crew that we've sort of assembled to try to piece this together that, you know, really at the end of the day, is was critical for us to have something to argue about with voters, right? And so, you know, if you're even if you're a voter who may think that you know we need more money in the government, is this the right vehicle? Is this choosing winners and losers? And some of the things that that we've been able to to figure out from the text of the initiative that with Caltech's help um, has really has really been a very important part of the whole campaign plan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right on that, Tom, just to even, even to go into that a little bit further was um, we spent the first eight months of this year really just exposing flaw after flaw after flaw. And each of those flaws um, were targeted, um, A, to help us build the coalition, uh, B, to keep them on their heels, uh, and to pass, and, you know, ultimately to kill the ballot measure. And, and like the example would be the ag exemption, right? Um, and the exempt the ag exemption, right? Working with Caltax to flush out that policy allowed us to bring in the Farm Bureau, allowed, allowed us to bring in all of the ag associations, you know, Western growers, everybody else. And we couldn't have done that. I mean, you know, I, I can go have the conversations and the relationships, but without Caltax's work in that space. And we did the same thing on the solar flaw. We did the same thing on um, I can't, we have so many of these, I can't even remember them all right now because we're kind of in the, in, in the end of it. But we had a series of eight or nine of them over the summer where every two weeks we rolled one out. And that's what allowed us to build that coalition. Well, and, and, and I think the crucial one is, uh, when I mentioned NAACP, is how, how a split role impacts uh, communities of color uh, and, and dis, you know, traditionally disenfranchised communities. And so you know, building that whole encyclopedia has been crucial. Uh, agreed with you. Yeah, great point. Um, I thought I would um, take a minute and um, uh, level set everybody on the election and to the point of this, uh, I guess this meeting is, you know, what's going to happen next week, you know, and, and I'm a political consultant. I've been doing this for 30 years. And normally I get a call on election morning and someone says to me, you know, what's turnout? What's happening? And my answer is people are voting. Um, you know, that's what people do on election day. And, 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 and now in California and the rest of the country, they vote all month now. Um, you know, so what's happening? Well, people are voting. And let me give you the context around um, people are voting uh, phrase that I use. So um, 22 million voters in the state of California. Um, uh, contextually, um, that's a lot of votes. Um, we've seen a lot of new registrations this year. That's gone up significantly over the past eight to 10 years, as we've seen motor voter taken into, into effect. Uh, we're seeing online voter registration happen, et cetera. Um, so you've got 22 million voters. Uh, in, in historically, in, in presidential elections, if you were to just take the last eight elections, uh, take the turnout levels, divide it by eight, you'd see about a 75% turnout. Now, that's, you know, that's a pretty easy, um, what's turnout going to be a 75%? Well, the high watermark in that is Obama at 79%. All of the voter contact that we've done for the campaign has geared towards an 85% turnout model. We don't want to leave people on the table, right? If, if, if Tom Hiltak is a, a one of four voter and you might've missed the last couple of them and he decides this one's important, we want to make sure we talk to him. So all of our voter contact has kind of gone into this 85%, even a couple of matching into the 87% range, just out of concern uh, for all this energy that is out there. And don't get me wrong, there is a lot of energy. And I hear, um, I've heard every election cycle I've been in now for 30 years, everyone tells me, um, this is the most important election of our lifetime. I don't know if that's the case, because it can't always be that, but it's the craziest. And I, I can tell you this has a lot of energy in it. So there's going to be a lot that happens. So um, 
you got 22 million voters. Um, if you were to take, I, you know, I think turnout ends up being about 82%, but let's use the 85% number. And that's about 18.7 million voters. I know there's a lot of accountants on here. I'm using uh, my public school math, so I'm doing some rounding here, but 18.7 million voters. Uh, today we have um, in the neighborhood between seven and a half and eight million uh, votes that have already been cast. Uh, I'm gonna use the seven and a half million number. Uh, we get that from a, a, a political data company called Political, uh, political Data. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not the Secretary of State numbers or the county numbers, but it's seven and a half is a good number. So at that point, we're about 40% of the way there to an 85% turnout model. So that means in the next, what's gonna happen in the next week is we're going to see a lot of votes get counted. We're going to see 60% of the vote come in. Uh, today's Tuesday. We're going to see that all happen in the next week. Um, before you joined and we came on, uh, Tom Hilltack was telling me that a lot of counties are already, pro well, counties are processing those already. Many of them are already counting, but not, you know, hitting the final step to this is tally. Um, so we're going to see a lot of votes get cast on election night. Um, one of the pieces of this whole vote by mail um, election that we've moved to is you had um, historically um, absentee ballots, uh, or we called them absentee ballots back in the day, uh, were developed by Pete Wilson and his folks. And Republicans really had the early advantage on absentee ballots. Uh, before they were permanent, we would really drive our folks to apply for them. Uh, we, we, you know, we really, you know, historically had had that in the state of California. Um, and so as a result, Republican voters and, and voters more likely to oppose Prop 15, um, historically, they would return their ballots early. Uh, and we would count them and we'd be in the bank, right? We'd be good. Uh, and and the, the difficulty has been this election cycle uh, is there's been a, a, a giant concern about the U.S. Postal Service coming from the president, uh, president encouraging his voters to show up on election day and vote. Um, and so what we've seen is a real flip because you saw the, the, the Biden-Harris campaign say, vote early, get your votes in, get your votes in. So as we look at returns, we're seeing a disproportionate number of Democrats getting their votes, their ballots turned in. And what we normally see historically on, on absentee ballot returns is we see a real big spike the first week. Uh, and then you see that tail off for about two weeks, and then you see the spike come back up again. And I think we're going to see the same thing here. Uh, the only difference is um, and what's crucial to us in the campaign and what we've really been focused on, Tom Hiltak and I had a conversation uh, last Saturday afternoon. I remember we're trying to, we saw this problem with our voters coming in late and we said, what else can we do? How do we make sure that they vote? We've put a heavy effort into get out the vote efforts uh, to make sure that those votes actually show up on election day because we're really concerned about making sure they come out. They come out. I just checked the weather today. I was looking at the seven day forecast, just making sure there was no rain especially in Southern California. That's what I worry about. You get, you know, you get a drop of rain in Southern California, you'd think that uh, uh, you had a tsunami. Um, so uh, we've, we've been really um, focused on that over the last, uh, you know, eight to 10 days uh, on the campaign. Um, let me walk you through um, sort of what we, you know, what we've done uh, as it relates to um, messaging. And I'm gonna tie that in a little bit to the survey data as well. Um, so we came out of Labor Day, uh, and we knew we had to be up on the air on Labor Day. We knew these early ballots were going to happen, um, and, and we knew that we couldn't let uh, the proponents uh, run uh, run for even a week or two without us being up first. So we actually we went up about the same time, give or take a day. I think they, they saw that we laid down a bye. They came in on Friday. We were scheduled for Tuesday or Monday. Um, uh, but... Um, strategically, we knew that they were good. We say they went big. We knew they were going to go big. They were going to talk about corporate um, loopholes, et cetera. And every time you see their ads, you'll see them on television, you know, it has the vision of the, the, the tall skyscrapers. We knew we had to go small. We had to be about small business. We had to be about how this impacts small business. It's the wrong time because of COVID. Uh, and so we went with the, with, with the, what we call barbershop ad. Uh, many of you probably saw it. Uh, 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 black barber, um, actually in a barber shop down the street from my house here, um, tells a story about how hard COVID's been, how hard um, this has all been, and now we're going to put a tax on them. Uh, you know, we don't explain what a triple net lease is. You all know what a triple net lease is. We don't get into all those details, but, you know, is rent's going to go up, et cetera. 
uh, we really saw great movement. Uh, right, right about that time, uh, PPIC came out with their first survey. Uh, had the, you know, we know, we all know it was a titled uh, title one summary that was really skewed against us. Uh, the attorney general, uh, working obviously with the unions, um, really pushed that uh, 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 a biased title one summary. So, you know, the, the measure started. At, I'm going to use a 57 percent number. I don't remember if I saw that in the PPIC or I saw that in our polling numbers, but this was testing about 57 percent. You know, give or take a point. Uh, you know, maybe 56, maybe 58, but it's in that range. Um, so we saw what we call the barbershop ad up against their ad, and we dropped them. Um, and, and when we look at a ballot measure, there's three steps to this. The first one is we want to get um, below. We want to get the yes side below 50 percent. I want to say it took us about two, two and a half weeks. We went from 57 percent to about 49 percent. The next step is we want to get on top of them. So we want our no vote on top of their yes vote. Um, and going into election day, we'd feel pretty good about that. Not great. We'd feel like we'd feel a little, you know, okay, this might, this, this, this is going to be tight, but we feel good. But the third step that we really want to get to is we want to get the no vote above 50%. So those are the three steps. First one is drop them under 50. Second one is get on top of them. Third one is, can we drive them over? Can we drive our numbers over 50% in opposition? Um, so with the barbershop ad, we got them under 50. Uh, I'd say about first of October, um, and uh, we've then pivoted our creative. Um, you probably saw for for a period of time we had uh, Alice Huffman, president of the NAACP, on air. Uh, terrific ad, telling a wonderful story about the inequities of Prop 15. Um, uh, and, and we saw a lot of good movement on that. And, and it kind of takes me to where we're at today, um, uh, which is our survey data. And, and I think even the um, latest PPIC survey data shows this late race, you know, uh, we do tracking on this. This race is basically tied at this point. Um, and, and so everyone understands how we do survey work at this time of the election. We do what's called tracking survey work, uh, rolling track. Um, we do a 250 sample every night. And in that 250 sample, it's not enough to say, hey, here's how the election is going to turn out, but it gives us enough of a snapshot. And then we add four nights together. So we do Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. We've got four nights, and how does that look? And then on Thursday night, we drop off Sunday nights. So we always keep this four day roll. We call it a four day roll. And I'll tell you, I look at these rolls, and it's not looking at tracking surveys, not for the faint at heart, because um, it can be really stressful because you're only surveying 250 people. Um, but I'll tell you this, um, some nights we're up two points, some nights they're up two points, some nights we're tied. Uh, and, and we kind of continue to hover in this, you know, 44 to 47 range, one side or the other. Uh, and, and so if you ask me, where's the polling today? The answer is, you know, this thing's tied, to be honest with you. Uh, and um, we've had a couple of good nights, um, but I don't really um, view a couple of good nights as a trend. You got to get four nights to consider it a trend. Um, but, you know, we're in this range of uh, we've been on top of them a couple of times. Remember, that's phase two is to get on top of them. We've been up, we've been on top of them a few times over the past few weeks. They've been on top of us. So um, this, this race is really tight. Um, we're worried about that turnout piece at the end. Um, to give you some context of our television buys, fundraising has been going really well. Uh, thank you, Rob, for all of your help um, and Caltax and its members. I mean, you know, Rob, Rob is, is beating the trees every day on this. Um, and, and to give you some context on spending and where we're at in the campaign, and, and really, um, I'll give you the historical numbers, but the truth is what matters is what happens between today and election day, right? Like, I mean, it, we're at the same starting line at this point. So what happens between now and election day is what really matters. Um, but historically, uh, the proponents have spent, uh, you know, I'm going to say close to 70 million. They've got a couple different committees. Um, and, and the main one has 65 million in it. They've got a couple other committees that have spent on a yes and yes on 15, yes on 16 message of a few million dollars. Um, you know, so they're right about the 65 to $70 million number. Um, I would say that for the past four weeks, um, we have been 
uh, um, probably outspending them just slightly every week or they outspend us every week. But the great part is Tony Russo, uh, who is the lead consultant on this, uh, actually gets more points for our buy than they do because he was smart and he laid down our buy back in August. We call that lay down the buy. If you buy your television time early, uh, you get a better unit rate. Um, so we have more gross rating points than them. We've had more gross rating points than them every week for the last four weeks, I believe. Uh, there are some markets where they have more than us. There are some that we have a lot more than them. Um, but on, 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 it's pretty parity, or we are slightly above them for the last four weeks. Um, through Rob's efforts on the fundraising, um, we're going to be at our, our at our record high on spending this last week at $12 million on television, which is pretty significant. I will say, in looking at the buy this morning, uh, they're still outspending us in the Bay. Uh, so uh, any last resources um, from folks on this call uh, or that Rob is able to pull together uh, in the next two to three days, we can we can add to our buy, you know, really up until Friday. Um, so anything that we can do over the next three days, uh, we have a real need in the Bay Area. Um, they, they, they've got about 800 to 1,000 more gross rating points than us going into the final week in the Bay. Everywhere else in the state, we're either ahead of them or in parity. Um, so I feel good uh, the rest of the state. But I really think in the Bay Area, we could use some help. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue that. We've got some creative up now. We came back with the barber spot, but we added some new language in there. Now that we're kind of getting into this phase of the campaign, our messaging is shifting a little bit. Um, back to what I call, the rest of the team doesn't call it this, but, but I call it kind of that, yeah, we heard this before kind of, kind of uh, messaging. You know, we've all heard the story. This money is going to go to education, et cetera. Uh, the team calls it kind of the lottery message, right? Every focus group that a p political professional has been to in the last decade, you start talking about education funding. It takes somebody 30 seconds in the, in the, in the um, focus group to say, well, that's why we passed the lottery to fund education. Um, and so you'll see that there's a little tweak in the messaging about this. We've heard this before from the lottery type of messaging, and you'll see that. Uh, we're going to about ready to swap out the creative uh, today uh, or tomorrow um, for the final uh, six days here. So that's going to change out. Uh, we've got a bunch of ads to test. I will say this campaign um, um, has – spent significant money on research um, and, and development of ads. Um, and, and I would, uh, you know, on my floor here, uh, figuratively, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of ads that are on the cutting room floor that aren't going to see the light of day. Uh, and I might put it up in the, it might even reach 100. Uh, and, you know, Tom Hiltak has uh, legally cleared all these, you know, we've gone through a lot of process on these and they're never going to see the light of day. We've done so much research on this campaign. Um, so I, I, as we go into the next week, uh, I really see that the key, the key pieces here are, you know, if we can get more on, on, on the Bay Area television, that's what I would do. We've pretty much maxed out our, our, our digital. One of the key things on digital, when I think about digital, is that when, you're, when you're starting to creep into an 80% turnout model, what, what we worry about as political professionals, what that brings into the electorate is what we call a, an in, uninformed or less informed voter. Um, and so it's really hard to find somebody who, um, you know, doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a, a, a TV network, doesn't have a, uh, uh, doesn't look at their mail, uh, and you got to find them somewhere. Where are you going to find them where it means something to them? And we've done some real creative things, actually, um, working with the compliance folks at, in Tom's office, uh, working with some TikTok uh, uh, influencers, believe it or not, potentially, um, so, you know, trying to reach into these uninformed voters, because uh, those are the ones that worry about us. Those that are informed, we're winning those on all of our tracking survey. We know our message is right to them. Um, it's the ones that are uninformed that show up on election day and fall, you know, for the attorney general's bias title and summary. So um, I think that's probably my main concern going forward. Um, but I feel good. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like this team uh, you all have left it all on the field and we're not going to leave anything unturned. I mean, we're texting 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, we've done about 300,000 texts in the last, you know, seven days. Uh, and, and all of those texts all have to come from someone live actually sending it legally. Uh, so it gives you a sense of where our volunteer base is. We have volunteers that are sending these text messages every day. It's just, uh, you know, a lot of activity. Uh, appreciate all the companies on this call 
uh, sending out, and again, this is Hill Tax Shop helping us with this, um, sending out emails. I, I got, uh, I have a storage unit, you know, public storage sent me a, a, an email saying vote no on Prop 15, just to have a storage unit. Uh, you know, and so the more of that you can do, I'm going to make one plug for the campaign's website real quick. Um, go to the take action page on the web page. If you need a document, it's on there. Um, you know, we've worked with Tom to get these together. If you want to communicate with your tenants, there's something on there. If you want to communicate with whoever you want, there's something on there that's canned. If it's not on there, feel free to reach out to Rob. He'll get a hold of me and my team. We'll create something for you. But my guess is it's probably on there pretty easily. Uh, Rob, I went a little long. I know it's probably a little bit more than, than, than a little longer you wanted to go. Um, but, uh, you know, happy to turn it back over to you and I'm sure and, and to Hilltack. Perfect. No, thank you so much. Uh, Tom, why don't we go back and um, cover some of the funding a little bit? I know, um, you know, yeah. some of the funding has been quite interesting to watch come in. And I'd be yeah, let me, let me, um, uh, and I'll go short since Tom went long. Um, Sorry. <laughs> that's right. I, uh, maybe some context would be helpful because um, you think of, gosh, we, you know, we're going to raise and spend about $70 million on a no campaign and they're going to raise about $70 million on a yes campaign. It seems like a lot of money. Um, but I put that into context. First of all, as Tom mentioned, we've been basically voting for now for a month. So the ballots started going out the first couple days of October. And so our campaign and all of the other campaigns had to deal with the fact that people were gonna, were gonna vote early. They said they were gonna vote early. So those campaigns that had money to do research, you know, they knew that as soon as people got their ballots, you know, they had made a decision about how they were gonna vote in the presidential election. So they were ready to vote. And so the, the, the whole point of a campaign is to send a message and drive your awareness up as high as you can possibly go. And, and a target for most of the campaigns I've been associated with is if you can get awareness up in the high 70s to low 80s, you've done a really great job of, of communicating messages. But you're still leaving you know, 15 to 20% of the electorate who still doesn't really know what prop, whatever, pick a number is until they go into the ballot booth or vote or open up their envelope. Um, and so the objective, so we basically made campaigns a month long process, which has led to kind of an explosion of spending to where $70 million, you know, if you'd asked me eight years ago, that was, that was a record setting amount of money. But now we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be the highest spending campaign by a long shot. So the Prop 22, the fight over, over rideshare drivers, Uber and Lyft, Uber and Lyft and, and DoorDash and those companies, they're in for over $200 million, setting a record. And they're, the reason they're doing that is they've got to get voter awareness on Prop 22 up to that 80% you know, range. When voters are tuning out, they're not watching network TV, you got to find them on digital, you got to find them on on Hulu or whatever the heck they're listening to, or, or, you know, however you can texting them or robocalling them or whatever. And so those campaigns are really expensive. So this cycle, I expect there to be over half a billion dollars spent on just the ballot measure campaigns alone. That excludes all the legislative races, all the congressional races, and, and you know, California, we don't have a presidential race, thank God, because there'd be no time left on television. And the stations are making a killing, by the way. If you want to make a quick buck, own a local TV station. That's where you can make a lot of money. Um, so you take that and then you add in the other factor that Tom mentioned, which is what we were up against. And what we're up against is not just $70 million of spending by the unions to try to pass Prop 15. Even maybe more important to that was we were up against a description of Prop 15 that appears on the ballot that was written by the attorney general that in my estimation was probably worth 20 or 30 or $40 million. In other words, if you would have described Prop 15 fairly and said, hey, this is a $15 billion property tax hit or 11, well, I guess it was $12.5 billion property tax hit. Here's where the money goes, here's how the process works and, it and nobody sees money for three years. That's a fair actual description of what Prop 15 does. That's not what the ballot says. So we're up against we're fighting a campaign that we had to win, even if the unions would have put up no money. And we had to do it for a month longer. So we have a really, 
we had a really tough road to hoe, and and if we pull this off on election night, it'll be through the work of a lot of hard work, and unfortunately a lot of money to try to defeat this thing. But we were really up against, um, essentially in my mind, two opponents, um, you know, the attorney general and and the unions, and that's that's true of some of the other campaigns as well. So. The high spenders, I think this cycle will be Prop 22 at about 200, and count both sides, about 220, 230 million dollars. Um, Proposition 23 is the dialysis measure. Um, they're going to be over 120 million dollars combined on the yes and no side by the time it's over. And then I think we fall a slip in right there. And then there's this the poor stepchildren ballot measures that, that Tom and I were talking about earlier, who are only spending. 10 or $20 million, which used to be kind of what you'd spend on a campaign, you know, a decade or so ago. That was a lot of money. Um, but at, but ad rates for a week of television, you need to spend between five and $10 million a week to reach, you know, probably what Tom, maybe 50, 60% of the electorate if you're on, on television. So, so that's a lot of money to, to leave a, a bunch of people left on the table. So, you know, I think, at, at, a lot of credit to the business community for stepping up, but we had a we had a lot of a lot of factors working against us that required us to spend that amount of money. So, and hopefully, it's going to turn out to be enough. Yeah, Tom, I would add. You said you know we kind of had not only the the unions and the AG as opponents. I, I would add two more opponents. I, I like the way you frame that. And one is, as you describe it, we're competing against the other ballot measures for attention. Uh, you know, for, for uh, at their attention, right? If I'm seeing four commercials for Prop 22 during the World Series tonight, um, although I guess in your Bay Area, no one's watching it because it's Dodgers. But um, but but you know, and, and I'm only seeing one on Prop 15. You're you're fighting for that attention span too. So that's a, I, I kind of think as our third opponent, but not our opponents, but the third. And then the other one has just kind of been this surprise. It hasn't just been the unions funding the opposition campaign. We've got you know Zuckerberg and Facebook in at 10 million dollars against us. Uh, we got the the widow of, of Steve Jobs that's in for I think seven figures also. We got Mark Benioff in for four hundred thousand. So, you know, it's not just you know we're fighting some new new battles that we've never had to fight before. Oh, um, you know, oh by the way, we had COVID, and then we had COVID, right? We had a campaign plan that could have never anticipated the fact that the economy would be shut down, and. And so we had to sort of, you know, adjust for that along the you know, along the fly, and not really knowing how long this was going to stretch out. So even back in March and April, when we started to say, "Oh gosh, this is going to be a new dynamic in the campaign," was yeah. it going to be over by the time people were voting or not? And it turns out, no, it's not. So, so we've really yeah. been we've really faced a bunch of of obstacles along the way. And, and your COVID point is good, Tom, because. You know, the problem that that, I mean, it's, it's the electorate piece of that too, but you know, all of you on the Zoom have been impacted by this financially. Most of your companies have seen, you know, significant hits. And so from a fundraising perspective, you know, it's, I tell you what, it's a lot easier in my job when, when a client comes to me and says, hey, I, I'm gonna have a baseline budget of $150 million. Um, you know, I can build a plan that works towards $150 million, but you know, in this campaign, it's been, Hey, you know, we're going to build a plan at hundred. No COVID hit. Let's drop that down to 70. And then you do some fundraising for a while and go, I don't think we're going to hit 70. We got to take it down to 50. And then you're working on a 50 plan and you go, okay, I can add some more. So you're kind of building this airplane while you're flying it too. Um, and, and, and I, I think, I, I, I mean, I can't say this enough to the folks on the call. Um, we know how tough it's been out there with this COVID um, and the business shutdowns. And, and the amount that you've been able to step up is really appreciated. Um, I mean, it has really been appreciated. Um, it, we know it isn't easy. Um, and and I, I can't say that enough because, you know, people are hurting out there. Their businesses are hurting. People are letting people go. And it, we know it's difficult. Um, so we really do appreciate that. Hey, Tom, I want to ask you something. So um, election day is obviously next Tuesday. What happens after that? Um, what's the timeline for certification of results? Um, if somebody's going to file a legal challenge, um, what's the window look like on that? So election night's going to be a little different than I think we, we've seen over the last couple cycles um, because so many people will have voted early. 
So there was a good story today in Cal Matters for anybody who wants to look at it about what the counties are doing with respect to the ballots that they're processing now. So a vote by mail ballot comes in, it comes in an envelope, you've all seen them, they're signed by voters and they check the signatures to make sure they match. They pull the ballots out of the envelope and they queue them up and get ready to have those ballots counted. Historically, what they would do is they'd just queue up those ballots and then once the polls closed at eight o'clock, they'd run them all through the counting machines and that would be the first returns you'd receive. This um, election cycle, they've been given authority to run those ballots prior to election day, but what they can't do is they can't tabulate the total. So they can't basically push a button and say, okay, well, what's the, what's the count so far? So I expect that probably six, seven, eight million ballots will be counted yeah. um, and ready to hit tabulate once eight o'clock strikes and the polls close. And so I would think that by nine o'clock, maybe you'll start to see, you know, millions of votes being counted, including those votes cast on election day by voters who've gone to the polls. And then it'll stop, right? There won't be a big wave of new additions because they'll have, they'll still have to, to process all the vote by mail ballots they received in the last few days. And then under California law, as long as that vote by mail ballot is postmarked on election day, even if it comes in up to 17 days after the election, that ballot still gets counted. So the last um, go round, last in 2018, and then in the primary of this year, it took elections officials almost a month to finish the counting of ballots. And so the question for us is going to be, it's going to take a month this year too, but will that month matter? Will, will it matter to change the outcome of the election? And that'll all depend on how many votes that are left unprocessed. And so Tom Ross is going to call me on Wednesday morning and say, start calling counties and start asking how many unprocessed ballots they have because then we'll have a general sense of how long it's going to take for them to do that, do that process. And what that means is basically the, the process that they'd undergone in the first three weeks of the election are, is then duplicated in the last three weeks, which is oh, take an envelope, compare the signature, look at it. The difference is there'll be a bunch of lawyers looking over their shoulder after the election, because for some reason we spend a lot more time worrying about the ballots cast after the election than we do about the ballots cast at the front of the election. And so that process will take two or three weeks or thereabouts. Uh, the ballot certification is legally required to be done by the Secretary of State. I believe it's December 11th or 12th. I can't remember which day. Um, and so that would be the final certification, but we'll know before that for sure what the outcome is. Um, and then in terms of legal challenges, you know, Prop 15 is an interesting beast because it's such a complicated initiative and it, it does have a bit of a phase in period. So I don't expect litigation in connection with the conduct of the election necessarily. Um, that's already been done, but there's gonna be a lot of litigation about Prop 15 for that if it passes for the next decade or so um, as we sort of just pick away at it and try to figure out how does it apply and, and you know, how frequently people have to go in for reassessment and assessment appeals. And we've already heard from the Assessors Association, they don't even know how they're gonna implement Prop 15. And so there'll, there'll be a lot of, you know, God help us if it passes, but it'll be a mess for years to come, so. Well, I do wanna uh, leave time for some Q and A. So if you are on, you can use the chat to ask a question. Um, and I guess I'll start with an, another question. Uh, so I did get a question from one of our members a few days ago asking, well, since there is such a long phase in time, couldn't you just run an initiative to repeal it? Is that possible? Has it been done uh, for other measures in the past? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so the it would be two years from now, right? So we only conduct ballot measure elections every general election cycle, so you'd be to 2022, you'd have to start the process of qualifying something like that about a year in advance of that, and it's not cheap. So you're talking about spending probably 10 million plus just to get it on the ballot to have this fight over again. Um, and so that is the, that would be the challenge of doing that. And then you, of course, you, you know, depending on the outcome, you know, the voters have just passed this 
are they likely to change their mind two years from now? But the electorate would be different too. I mean, there might be three, four, five million less voters in an off election year. So interesting concept. But God, I, like I said, Tom and I don't want to think about that right now. We don't think about it. Right. <laughs> Work about it next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so we got a question. Um, if Prop 15 passes, is it possible that the legislature could amend the rules to make it workable or narrow it? It's a really good question. Um, first of all, I haven't known the legislature to make anything better. <laughs> so um, I think our biggest fear is that the legislature, there, there's enough wiggle room in the initiative for the legislature to actually expand its application to to areas that we hadn't really considered, you know, home-based businesses being an example, but we actually had to litigate over that issue. Um, the, the initiative does provide a lot of authority to the legislature to do a lot of things. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's there's going to be, you know, the legislature is going to have a say in how this is all implemented um, in, in a lot of areas, in, in the phase-in period, in the allocation of revenue period side of the equation. Um, they basically get to choose the winners and losers um, under the initiative, and, and I expect that to occur. Um, one other question, and this is for you, for you Tom. Um, I've talked to a lot of you know, my counterparts at other state taxpayer associations, and they've noticed that a lot of California's voters have uh, moved to their states, and I'm sure that has had an impact on what our electorate looks like. Um, have you noticed anything in terms of what messaging works or what doesn't based on kind of how the electorate has shifted? Um, I, I mean, that's, that's why we spent so much time on building a coalition that is as diverse as it is today. And, and you know, 20 years ago, we could have run a anti-tax campaign, you know, with CalTax and local taxpayer organizations in the business community. And, you know, we can't win this election with that, with that, um, uh, with that uh, coalition. A and, you know, our key, our key um, swing groups are, to be honest with you, are Democrat homeowners and MP no party preference homeowners. Uh, and, and um, you know, we can actually get a lot of movement with renters also, NPP renters. I'm not saying we're gonna win them, but we can drive their, 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 you know, where they might be a 70% on the ballot measure, we can drive them down to a 50%. Well, that's good movement for us. Um, so the answer is, uh, it, it's really impacted the electorate. And there's a great story in the Sacramento Bee this weekend about conservatives moving to Idaho. Um, and, and so the answer is, it's, it's, it makes this fight even harder, especially in an 82% turnout model. As Tom was saying, you know, in 2022, we're going to be down at, you know, 50 to 60 percent. That's a whole different electorate. So uh, we're feeling it for sure, but we planned for it too. No. Um, so we've got another question that came in. There are still many people alive who own property when Prop 13 passed. In a period of time, no one will be alive when Prop 13, that was alive when Prop 13 passed, will still be alive but many corporations will still have an original Prop 13 basis. Um, does there some need to be something proactive in 10, 20 years? Um, is this an issue that you noticed in polling or that um, you've seen raised yeah. concerns? I, by I, the Tom, you can tell me if you agree, but I, I think this is something we're gonna learn after this campaign is over. Um, it, it is certainly the, the issue of Prop, ter Prop 13 awareness and what Prop 13 does for, for particularly for homeowners and, and even for the business community is something we've been concerned about over time. But, but there may be, you know, assuming we pull this off and we win next week, there may be some residual benefit of reinvigorating, you know, Prop 13 in the minds of voters that, you know, might, might extend its sort of life cycle, I think. Um, and the fact that, you know, the media continues to talk about Prop 13, usually in a negative light, but I think that keeping it in the, in, in the, you know, the human discussion, I think is, is probably helped keep Prop 13 top of mind for people. And I think this, you know, this campaign could, could add a few more years to that as well. Um, yeah. I don't know, Tom, I don't know what you think about that. But well, I, all, all, I think, of, all I of our early, yeah. 
Yeah, all of our survey data showed that if we educated folks on Prop 13, they're more likely to vote no on Prop 15. Um, and so we spend a lot of time um, building that that goodwill, and I think it's helped us. And along the way, we actually added about uh, you know 300,000 advocates uh, on behalf of Prop 13 um, that we can utilize in other battles. So. I think we're going to have to continue to educate on Prop 13 uh, would be my answer on that. We've got to continue to talk about it and, and have it out there. Um, and then if Prop 15 fails, will it likely be put on the ballot again in two years and keep coming uh, up? You know, I, I, I've heard this a couple times in the last two days. Um, and I, I think that Green Street wrote on this uh, in one of their analysis and said, you know, um, and, and, I, and I fundamentally disagree um uh with that premise um you know look they're they're running this election in in probably the highest potential turnout model available to them this is the absolute best time for them to be doing this um i think that we've got to beat this thing i think if we beat it there's going to be um a lot of turmoil over at the california teachers association that they just spent you know north of 20 million dollars on a ballot measure that failed meanwhile they've got teachers that are struggling uh, in their own right, uh, locally. Um, remember, there was there was turmoil over at CTA actually to, to, to move forward with this measure when COVID hit, or even before COVID, and, and there was a big shift over there. So I, I know that there's some prognosticators saying they're going to keep doing this. Look, this stuff's expensive, and I get it that they get to reload their coffers every two years, but this isn't a decision that you can make real lightly to move forward with this year in and year out. So my answer to that question is, uh, you know, We'll have to see what they do, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Do I think there's going to be constant pressures for more tax dollars? Yeah. And, and I actually think what we've done here to defeat Prop 15 is the stepping stone that we can use to fight legislative battles that are going on that Rob and Caltax fight every day. And we've got to keep this coalition going um, in, in that sense. So that'd be my answer on that is, uh, you know, no, I don't know what they're going to do. And I, I, I think that this is a winning is a big deterrent. Right. Well, and somebody just told me, made this comment to me a few days ago that if Prop 15 passes and Prop 22 is rejected, I mean, there's nothing stopping the legislature from doing whatever they want because there are no consequences. Um, we, we had another question from John Kapal, and, uh, you know, I should do a shout out to John and thank him for all the work that he's doing and uh, coordinating with the campaign. Yeah. And um, John has been running some great radio ads uh, throughout the state. Um, so thank you for all that. Uh, he asks, can we make another run at the Dell Fix if Prop 15 uh, fails? And so the Dell Fix being the change in ownership um, from you know, multiple uh, investors into a property. I know the realtors had tried that uh, through an initiative, Tom. I don't know if you saw polling on how that went yeah, I think I think it goes back to what Tom was just talking about, which is you know the bigger question I think uh, you know if we win next week is what's the makeup of the legislature after this election, and do they have the stomach to pass taxes on their own? Um, you know we've we've seen the gas tax passed and and there, there's you know they're going to think that they need more money for sure, and you know it would, depending on how the COVID affects the budget going forward. Um, so where, where are they going to turn? And so I think in Dell Fix is an example like, okay, we've, we, we didn't do this for years because we were waiting for this split roll battle. That didn't work out for us, but we need revenue and that helps get revenue and that's an easy fix. Let's just go ahead and do that. Uh, you know, particularly when the business community generally supported that, that fix. It seems to me that, you know, that ought to be a no brainer, but politics makes everything not a no brainer. So. Yeah, I, I can speak to it from a political perspective. Um, I would say we picked up probably two or three newspaper editorials because we pushed the Dell fix uh, in previous uh, legislative sessions um, because it gave the editorial boards a place to land uh, that this wasn't just a loophole closure because um, we had offered up the loophole closure. So uh, it was actually from a campaign, just from a political operative perspective, it was very helpful in this campaign having that as a solution out there. Um, Tom Ross, uh, I think I've seen a couple uh, comments from you in prior meetings where you've talked about kind of the education lobby 
and they had started a group called Commit to Equity over the summer, and they were pushing the wealth tax. Um, how did that play into all this as well? Um, it, you know, um, I, I was just telling Tom Hiltak when, when, right before we started, uh, of, well, you know, they're going to be at about $70 million. That's of what we can count. Um, there's a huge effort that goes on behind the scenes on public um, persuading the public that's non-reportable that they spend year in and year out. And, and it, it's, you know, it's big sums. It's not just a million dollars. It's, you know, we're talking fives and 10 millions of dollars um, and pushing on uh, the need for more education funding, pushing on, uh, you, you know, portraying uh, the businesses as the bullies, et cetera. So, um, you know, uh, you're going to see a big, um, you know, whether it's the millionaire's tax, whether it's getting rid of the um, inheritance tax. I mean, you guys know more of this. You guys know more taxes. Actually, plug for, for Cal tax here and their, their annual, um, here's how much the legislature submitted in taxes. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the target list potentially um, in the legislature. Oh. Well, closing comments from either of you? I just, I guess my only close is, uh, like I said earlier, thank you, Rob. Thank you, members of Caltax. Um, thank you. I mean, this has been a really tough environment to be running in. Uh, as you can tell, I've had a haircut. You know, I mean, uh, uh, and, and you guys have really gone all out. And I think everyone has. And, and, you know, let's run through the tape. If there's anything you can do, like I said, we have a need for more Bay Area TV. If there's anything you can do, um, every little bit's going to make a difference. Um, and, and I don't want to wake up on the 11th or on, on Wednesday, next Wednesday, and say, man, I could have just had a little bit more left in my tank. And this, this race is that close. I mean, it, it really is. I've been involved in races and I can tell where they're trending. This one's close. Um, and so I'm nervous. So any, anything you've got left, let's put it all in the tank and let's go. Yeah. Tom Ross, Tom Hiltek, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, from the very beginning, we've always said that this is a fight we can win if we can get our message out in front of the voters. Um, that, of course, requires funding and engagement from everyone on this uh, call. And so, as um, Tom Ross and Tom Hiltag discussed, uh, we've got a fight on our hands and we can use uh, help on funding. So if there's anything you can do on that front, please email me, rob at caltex.org, and I can um, uh, tell you how to get more involved. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.